Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for joining us uh, for uh, this uh, webinar talk, and thanks for joining Open Power Summit. And uh, so I am Argya Kusum Das, an assistant professor of computer science in University of Wisconsin, Platteville, and an advisory board member of uh, Institute Data Education Initiative. Uh, and today, Together uh, with, uh, so my co-presenter is Dr. Peter Hofsty, who is a distinguished research staff member at IBM Austin, USA, and also a professor of uh, TU Delft, Netherlands. And uh, both of us together, we will present a new course that we have developed, collaboratively developed, uh, and goes by the name on a course accelerating big data analytics application on with FPGA and Open Capi. So here are the agenda for uh, my part. Uh, so I will take it for 15 to 20 minutes and then I will uh, leave uh, it for Peter. And so this is the agenda for my part. This is, uh, so first I am going to discuss a little bit about a hardware acceleration of big data analytics, uh, then uh, technology survey a little bit what are the different hardware technologies available for um, accelerating big data analysis, uh, for example, GPU, FPGA. And then I will introduce briefly what is OpenCAPI and what, uh, what is its motivation and all these things. And uh, then I am going to give you a brief idea of uh, Onstitute and uh, its collaborative efforts with TU Delft and uh, Paul Scherer Institute uh, to bring this course to the community. And uh, after that, I will give you a little bit of course highlight and then we will show you the where you can access the course. So what is hardware acceleration for big data analysis and why do we need it? So the big data size is growing exponentially. Every day, because of the large scale scientific facil uh, facilities, because of uh, our mobile phones, because of the electronic movement of the world, uh, big data is growing exponentially. Its growth basically outpaced Moore's law, which limits the number of chips per die, which basically limits the fastness of a computer or the speed of a processor, big data, the huge amount of big data is outpacing that every day. So basically new techno, since this is outpacing Moore's law, new technologies are required for its efficient analysis. And uh, well, in the last decade, we have seen several different uh, programming model, for example, uh, MapReduce, uh, 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 graph processing framework, deep learning models, machine learning models, different software tools have been proposed. Uh, however, uh, not only the software tool is enough anymore. The community needs more. Uh, hardware environment should also be improved. So here, the hardware needs to be better, means it should be faster, it should be cost effective because as of now, if uh, the big data in the, in the arena of big data analytics, it is uh, pretty much evident that if you can improve the, I mean, increase the resources like RAMs and processors, uh, add more cores, add more hardware resources, your process will become faster. There is no question about that, but is it cost effective? And also there is a new need in the community that if, is it possible to customize the hardware configuration and uh, somehow so that we can uh, accelerate our, uh, accelerate the workload based on the specific need. So that's why the hardware environment also needs to get better. So here is a small technology survey. Uh, this slide basically shows the evolution of different accelerator technologies. So uh, in the beginning, if most of the focus on, so it started with a single threaded uh, processor where like a more active transistor was uh, 
being added to the processors with higher level of frequency to accelerate our workload. But uh, following several limiting factors at some point of time, uh, the, acceler the frequency of all the transistor got saturated. And uh, well, uh, so we could add, so at that time, the community actually shifted to multi core processor. Well, one transistor, one core, adding more transistor in one core is not improving the process, but can we add more cores so that we can improve the entire process? Well, that also worked for pretty good amount of time. Uh, and we got uh, lots of uh, hardware innovation in terms of multi-core processor. But after some time, uh, these uh, capability of these multi-core also become limited uh, because there are power limit, because of the cost limit and for all the different issues. So cores cannot be improved, uh, cannot be just increased exponentially to get the performance and to get it uh, to make your application cost effective. So the community actually moved to the hybrid computation and so that uh, you can do the hardware configuration uh, frequently based on your needs. So that gives the that gives the bar gives birth to the special purpose uh, computation uh, ASIC type of hardware. And uh, right now we are going through that era. So in the last uh, few years, we have, uh, other than multi-core, we have seen several uh, specific technologies to accelerate our big data analysis uh, uh, things. For the most prominent is uh, GPU, which is essentially an extremely fast and efficient computing devices that consists of many parallel processors. So those GPUs are basically built for parallel calculations with many parallel arithmetic and logical units, and they also have a faster memory access. But the question is, can we, uh, the question is, is there any limitation in terms of programming model? Because GPU always follow some, some type of programming model and your big data analysis application needs to fit into that model to get the performance. Sometimes it is possible, sometimes it is not possible. Another major factor is GPU is really very costly. So here comes FPGA. FPGA stands for Field Programmable Gate Array, which consists of an array of logic gates that can perform any digital implementation desired by the developer. Means developer can customize the configuration based on their need. It is like a network switch which can connect or disconnect the logic gates uh, to create specialized circuitry based on the application needs. So as you can understand, the potential is enormous. You have some special type of application and you can customize the hardware uh, according to your need. So it can show you better, give you better cost effective application. It can be, uh, it can do better analysis. Also, it can show you much better performance than GPU if configured properly. And also, there is a flexibility in terms of programming model that the community can get from FPGA. So that's about a compar small comparison between GPU and FPGA. But the thing is, Programming an FPGA is really very hard. Uh, it needs uh, specialized knowledge and uh, it's harder than programming a GPU. And that's why you have to know, you have to have specialized courses on FPGA. Now, in order to make the life simpler, IBM has done a great job by developing open capi technology, which makes the FPGA program easier. And uh, together with OpenCAPI, Institute uh, has collaborated with TU Delft Netherlands and PSI Switzerland to bring the knowledge of OpenCAPI and FPGA to the big data analysis community. So what is OpenCAPI? 
in a broader view, open CAPI can be described as an open coherent accelerator processor interface that of course the abbreviated uh, form, uh, the full form of open CAPI. And uh, here it is basically an open industry standard device interface. It has, it supports high bandwidth and low latency, which are very necessary for current big data analysis. And also it is easy to inter, easy to use interface for programming. They, those things are also being provided by OpenCAPI. So OpenCAPI Accelerator Framework or OC Axel in short form helps easily create the FPGA based acceleration engines or acceleration framework together with OpenCAPI interface. And in our course, you are going to get the idea of all these things. So here is, a, here is our collaborative effort. So Onstitute is a data education initiative uh, where the data education is one big data problem that we are committed to solve. We collaborate with many different scientists across the globe and bring the current development in the form of course and in the form of education to bring that uh, those things uh, to bring the knowledge of those developments to the community so for this course we have collaborated with tu delft open power and paul Scherer institute and university of wisconsin platteville to bring the knowledge of open capi and fpga for big data analysis to help improve the to help the community to analyze the big data better so here are the our team of in instructors. We have got uh, Dr. Peter Hofsky from uh, IBM, uh, then Dr. Philip Leonarski from Paul Scherer Institute, Dr. Zaid Al Ars from TU Delft, uh, Dr. Yust Hilzeman, uh, Dr. Johan Peltensberg from TU Delft. So all the group of instructors have developed this course and basically they are the pioneer in this field uh, they are the early developer of this field and uh, so whatever you are going to learn in this course those are directly from the developer's mouth so here are some of the course highlight so here basically whatever you will learn as i have mentioned earlier you will be learning directly from the developers here you can listen to the video lectures you can download the platform agnostic virtual machine and container for hands-on so that you can easily make your laptops and desktops a development environment for open capi and you can also get your hands dirty with coding on jupyter style notebook so we have kept the course in an accessible level so that any level of big data analyst, starting from entry to the advanced level developer, all of them can uh, get the idea of FPGA and OpenCAPI with a hands-on experience. And not only that, through this course, you will get the opportunity to be involved in the development process. We all have shared the GitHub repository and you can join the group and help the development and help contributing the uh, contributing towards the improvement of the field uh, of FPGA based development and uh, all the other things that are going on. Now, so the other thing is the hands on uh, another feature of this course is the hands on are all enabled by Fletcher, which is basically a framework to integrate the FPGA accelerator with Apache Arrow, which is a popular in memory uh, tabular format uh, provided an open source uh, library for that. And well, uh, the beauty of Fletcher is it is again platform agnostic. So it will run on any environment irrespective of processor. So to learn, to start learning, you really do not need to depend on IBM power machine or access to some supercomputer or access to some high performance machine. You can directly start learning with your desktop or your laptop. However, the code developed in this way can be easily ported to IBM power machine or your production environment without any change 
but at that time of course you can get maxima uh, the maximum performance because power processor is really fast so now here is the availability of uh, this uh, course the entire course is basically available in institute website at uh, free of cost and here is a uh, some small screenshots of institute website uh, you can get the access the course from anywhere in the world and uh, just you need to have the internet connection and uh, that's all and uh, this is a sample screenshot of our uh, web page, the course web page, uh, where as you can see, there are video lectures and not only the video lectures inside the DIY section, you will get all the information related to the virtual machine, which you can download and make your machine a simple OC accelerated uh, development environment. So all these things you will get in the Institute website once you will register for this course. So here are some uh, useful links. Uh, like uh, this is the first one is the course web page link. The course is available at uh, https .institute slash course open power page where you can see the link for this course and you can do register and uh, you can start learning. We also have created a guitar chat room. So if you are a developer, if you are already working in a software industry and you want to uh, connect with the developer of Fletcher and developers of OpenCAPI, you can post your question in the Gitter chat room and the developers will uh, uh, answer you. And also we have a YouTube playlist where you can uh, just go and then subscribe to our YouTube channel and learn all the video lectures. And also there is a Fletcher GitHub repository. If you want to contribute towards the Fletcher development, that is also possible. And, uh, and the dev our developers community will be very welcoming to you. So that's, uh, and uh, well, so but that is, uh, it so and uh, well the other thing is of course we are open for collaboration as i have told you can join the developer community through the github you can uh, learn the courses you can do the hands-on propose some improvement to the course or if you are a university professor adopt this course for the university the same way tu delft is uh, possibly going to do in the next semester and uh, also, if you have any suggestion or any recommendation, uh, just let us know uh, in our Institute website. So that's all from my side. Now I would like to invite uh, uh, Peter to share his thoughts. He can share several knowledge on the more technical sites, which can be really motivating for the big data analyze, analyzer. All right, very good. Thank you, Arno. Um, uh, All right, so, so what I will do here is uh, try to just take a, a little bit of a step back and provide some further motivation for why people might be interested or should be interested uh, in, in, in this class and uh, place it in the broader uh, big data. Uh, context. Um, so there are th three things that I'll talk about. Uh, first, uh, big data analytics and, and in-memory aspects of that, some of the benefits and challenges of, of this uh, transition that's happening, and uh, you know how we can address those challenges. So the first, and um, RJ already uh, referred to this, you know, uh, uh, there's a lot of data available, and, and not only is there enormous growth in the amount of data, we like to have a lot more of that data on hands, right? We like to do um, reactive and instantaneous type calculations, give answers with good response times. And that quite often means that the data has to be uh, in memory. Now, you know, in memory computing uh, is not new uh, and even distributed uh, in memory computing is not new. 
Um, things like key value stores have been around uh, in the last several years uh, in memory databases, uh, for example, like uh, SAP HANA or, or um, uh, DB2 Blue, you know, have become uh, more prevalent. Um, and, and also Spark can be, can be thought of as a sort of an in-memory counterpart to, uh, to Hadoop uh, big data environment. So, so what is new here? Now, what is new is that what we want to do is have data in memory that essentially used to be in something like a file system or perhaps a key value store. Um, and we want to use that data in memory in a byte addressable, virtually addressable form and, and share that data between applications, right? Without the need to serialize or deserialize or copy um, and, and actually directly access that, um, that data. So, so what does that mean? Well, it has, you know, of course, big benefits. It uh, means that instead of thinking about files and sequential access and all that, uh, we have a, a, a random access paradigm and that clearly has benefits. Um, by having memory be virtually addressable uh, we, and, and, and objects in memory be virtually addressable, and we avoid the serialization, the serialization costs that have been coming, common to sharing even memory-based objects between languages. And by not having a requirement for a separate device memory, but having full access to shared memory across the machine and across all the accelerators, um, we have much more flexible accelerator integration. You don't have to copy things to a buffer for an accelerator to get at it. Uh, and the accelerator can be a more active rather than a passive component. And, you know, you can listen to some of the earlier talks on, on CAPI and Open CAPI and Open Power Summits uh, if you want to learn more about this. However, these big benefits come with some big challenges. Um, the first is that if data is sitting in memory and you intend to share it between applications, then these different applications need to agree on what the format of the data in memory is. And you know, traditionally this has not been done, right? The, the, the compiler for the application or, or the end or the runtime, you know, determines uh, what the data looks like. And here, you know, you're going to actually have to have agreement on, on formats. The second is there is a need for hardware standards so that. Um, you know, various uh, components, in particular accelerators and uh, uh, CPUs can, can interact mm -hmm. and, and leverage this kind of memory. There's going to be even more pressure on memory cost, right? Uh, by putting more and more data in memory, memory is, you know, which is already a considerable fraction of total memory cost. And this could put even more pressure on memory cost. And, and another one is that I.O. limited applications, uh, you know, data, hist uh, traditional databases being a, a great example, right? Where it really, you know, if you wanted to know the, the performance of a, of a big database applications, you didn't look at how many CPUs you had. You basically counted the number of spindles on your hard disk that gave you the best idea of what your database system was, was going to be. Now, you know, as we've moved to faster memory technologies like NVMe that has become more compute limited. But if you keep your data in memory, you know, that IO bottleneck is basically gone and, and, uh, and you become uh, compute limited. And, and data, databases are, are just one example, there are many uh, examples. So, so how, how do we address these challenges? Um, so in the case of uh, standard in memory formats, I, I'd like to highlight uh, Apache Arrow and I'll have a slide for each of these as, as a good example uh, of, of how we might um, share data through memory effectively be between applications. Um, the hardware standards, um, and also this was uh, already talked about in the um, uh, uh, Hasso Plattner Institute's talk uh, earlier today, uh, which, by, by the way, I really, really recommend that talk. I, I thought it was a great talk. <clears throat> so we have standards like uh, CAPI, Gen Z, and, and CXL that aim to provide the uh, hardware underpinnings to make memory shareable um, between accelerators and host systems and across host systems in a virtually addressed and, and coherent manner. 
Um, I will dwell a little longer on uh, efficient sharing of memory. So there is a technology that has been introduced in the processor in Power 10 uh, called Memory Inception and uh, has been prototyped on Power 9 with an open source project called uh, Thymesis Flow uh, that allows you to make much more efficient use of, uh, of memory. And, and that goes towards addressing the, uh, the memory cost issue. And then computation limited, um, right? When, when we have our data sitting in memory, we have addressed these other challenges. Uh, we have a challenge that uh, it's difficult for CPUs to keep up with all that capability that we've built out elsewhere in the system. And, and I'm not going to go deeply into this, but this is really the motivation, you know, for using accelerators and ultimately uh, for you to, to be in, should, why you should be interested in, in uh, the class and developing uh, accelerators that can work on shared memory. Uh, so first, uh, Apache Arrow. Uh, so this is a, uh, a project from, from the, an open source project, obviously, from the Apache Foundation. Um, very active, as you can see here on the top of the screen. Uh, you know, the project is already a, a few years old, but uh, if you look at this year, you can see that there is a, an average of close to 50 commits a week, right? So this is a continues to be a very, very active open source format. It provides a standardized in memory formats for column oriented uh, immutable data structures. Um, it has bindings for more than a dozen programming languages. So, uh, yeah, so, so that allows you flexibility across programming languages and many uh, projects uh, support it. You know, some projects like Fletcher and Dremio are you know, foundational, I would say. Dremio is a, uh, you know, you can think of it as a successor to Spark that is built on top of these uh, arrow data structures. And Fletcher, um, of course, you know, provides the connection between uh, this kind of data structure and memory and FPGA acceleration, as, as I just already uh, referred to. Um, and, and there is efficient conversion from uh, I'd say affiliated storage and on the network formats, uh, in particular Parquet and Aeroflight, uh, to ensure that uh, you can use this data efficiently, not, not only in memory, but uh, across the network uh, and uh, in storage. So that's one component. Uh, the next one is, uh, is standardization of, uh, of, of hardware and, 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 and the you know, along with this, you know, things like operating support, system support, uh, et, et cetera, right? So, so there is a variety of, of new standards aimed at uh, enabling this. I think we were uh, early with CAPI and Open CAPI in uh, introducing these kinds of concepts to the community. Uh, and I think with memory inception, Power 10 again takes a, takes a step uh, ahead. Um, but these, you know, these, these are standards that, um, you know, look like they will be uh, uh, widely adopted, right? So this kind of an approach, even though, you know, the power systems are, are the best place to do it uh, first, uh, it, it really looks like this is a, an, an industry uh, direction. Um, then um, memory inception. So initially with, with uh, CAPI and Open CAPI, we were primarily focused on um, establishing a, a good um, uh, way for, for accelerators on a single node to interact with the host processor. And of course that continues to be an important goal. But what we realized and, 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 and what is underneath uh, Timesis flow and, and, and also memory inception is that with open CAPI, a CPU essentially becomes a router. So how this, does this work? Well, when you come into a CPU from an open CAPI device uh, with an, an, a virtual address, in the case of power, we have you know, two level address translation. So it's actually effective address. Um, then that address gets mapped to a real address through the, through the page table. And, and, and of course, based on that, that real physical address, you, you, you're going to hit for example, a particular uh, memory port or another open copy port, uh, depending on, on how the system is set up. So by organizing the page table a certain way, we can map different uh, effective addresses uh, to different physical ports on the system. 
And you know the the, the new thing that um, that uh, memory inception provides is that when you take uh, an address that then comes out over over one of these physical ports at that point a, a physical uh, a real address, uh, you can actually map it back to a virtual address that makes sense uh, to the next system uh, and then connect to another system. And now now you basically you provided uh, a routing step, and and this gives you all kinds of interesting uh, capabilities. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll copy a few slides here from a presentation uh, last year at Hot Chips by, by Bill Starkey and Brian Tonto. Um, so, you know, and, and, and first thing I'd say is, you know, as a router, Power 10 is no slouch. You know, there's a two terabytes per second of, of combined bandwidth here between the uh, Axon, you know, uh, which includes open copy type uh, interfaces and, and memory interface. So it's it's not only a, a router in principle in, in practice, it's a, it's a very powerful one. So you could use this and interconnect a number of systems. And if you have systems that have varying memory requirements, and again, I point at the, the Hasselblad Institute's talk earlier today, uh, where you can learn more about this, is you can gain efficiency by being able to steal memory or even share memory with, with other nodes uh, in, your, in your cluster. Uh, so, so that obviously uh, helps the utilization of your memory and increases efficiency and reduces memory cost. Uh, the second one is uh, you can use this to create a very large memory space. So if indeed, you know, you might have so, as much as a petabyte of data with technology like this, you can make it uh, load store uh, addressable uh, across a, uh, a large cluster. Um, and you can, you know, begin to think about, uh, uh, say, a, a large uh, Power 10 system as a, uh, a memory server that uh, provides that, that large memory image, you know, either from a, from a single scale up system or perhaps a collection of them to accelerated, uh, sorry, to attached systems, you know, or, or accelerators, right? And sort of building out this, uh, this physical picture. Um, and then, uh, and, you know, as I mentioned, because uh, it, it is a, uh, uh, you know, with, with memory inception, there is essentially a routing capability. Uh, you can also use memory inception, uh, you know, to replace, uh, uh, essentially replace routing networks, right? So, so not only reduce your memory cost, uh, but, but reduce, uh, reduce your the networking uh, costs uh, as well. Um, I, I should mention that, you know, the, these are capabilities that are built into the power uh, processor. You know, this is not uh, a statement about uh, uh, supported capabilities in the, uh, in the now shipping uh, power 10 systems. Uh, but it, it, uh, you know, it, it is a very strong capability in, in power 10 processor. And with the power nine Kinesis Pro open source project, and, you know, everybody can get their hands on this and, and actually work with this type of technology. So, um, and, and this is uh, you know, where, you can, where you can find it. So then finally, um, I'll, I'll get to, uh, to compute limiting, uh, limited applications, right? With, with all these enhancements to, to memory capacity band, with cost, uh, you know, now, now the, the CPUs often become the, the weak link in your system. And um, we've introduced a number of uh, uh, acceleration capabilities on Power 10, right? Security, compression, and, and the, the matrix multiply assist uh, being three examples. Um, but if the industry is, is going to move ahead, you know, that, that, that is not going to be where it ends. We need to explore more. Uh, we will introduce uh, accelerators on FPGAs that maybe stay on the FPGAs, and we might uh, introduce other ones that later become um, a standard. So, for example, compression is an example of a, a technology that IBM uh, introduced on FPGAs and currently is building into both our uh, uh, C series and, and power uh, processors. 
So I, I hope that uh, I helped provide some uh, motivation for this class here. Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, the team is, uh, and, and, and in particular, Joost Rosemans, who, who I know is attending here, has done a, a marvelous job of, uh, uh, you know, creating these, these um, virtual machine and, and Docker images. Uh, that make it very easy for somebody to get started with this. It really gives you everything you need in, in one place. Um, and uh, we've also tried to make sure that we approach the project here, the, the, the topic here from a, uh, a kind of more of a software point of view than, than strictly a hardware point of view. Uh, and hopefully that, that will make it accessible to a, a broader uh, community. And I again emphasize, uh, as Arjia mentioned before, uh, that we hope that uh, the material that we put together will not only be adopted by others to teach at their universities, um, but also we would very much invite the community, whether in a, a university or, or, or an individual or a company, uh, to contribute their projects and exercises back to this project. Uh, so that we can, uh, you know, grow this uh, even further. And with that, uh, I'll give it back uh, to you, Arjun. And I think we'll probably take questions. You're, you're on mute, uh, by the way, uh, Arjun. Thanks, Peter, for the wonderful overview of the course and uh, some of the technical motivation, which I believe the community can uh, take the advantage of this course. And as Peter mentioned, that we are really open for collaboration from the education, uh, individuals or industry. Uh, feel free to use this course uh, to learn more about the Open Capi and make uh, open CAPI and FPGA in your development pipeline. And please feel free to contact us if you have any type of question. So I think it's a time for question and answer a little bit. Any question from the audience? So if nobody else has a question, I actually have one. Uh, so thanks for the, for the great introduction to the course. I look forward to uh, seeing loads of participants. Um, and I, I had a question uh, about uh, Peter's slide about the big, big challenges, big, big advantages, big challenges, right? Yeah. Because um, the additional needed memory because of the addition of accelerators, isn't it so that can also cause less memory to be needed? Because for example, you can push down some filters into your accelerator, or you can bypass host memory by writing from one accelerator to the other directly. Yeah, I think you're, 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 you're absolutely right. Um, you know the uh, I, I, I guess the the picture that I painted is sort of a, a first order one, right? Uh, where you I just say you, you you have a lot of data, you need to store it instead of having to store it sort of for every application that might need to access it. Uh, you can you know you can get ahead by storing it once and having all the app applications access it, right? And then, and then of course, you know, as, as uh, NUMA characteristics require, you know, pull that memory closer to uh, where things are, are being executed. I, I think what you are pointing out is, is also very true, right? If you're very good at integrating accelerators, you may become very sophisticated at, uh, for example, which tables are stored in a more compressed form and which ones maybe dynamically get uncompressed if they are used a lot, right? So uh, if you have them uh, behind an FPGA and, and, and you talked about even a, a next level of sophistication there where maybe, you know, you have a, an, an, an FPGA in the system and one of these compressed tables and, uh, you, you know, the FPGA is smart enough to pick out 
the the, the data the, ju just the data that you want right the, the uh, rare and select clauses in in a, in a database operation for example uh, so so yes absolutely i agree there is there is opportunity uh, you know be beyond uh, just creating a a, a large uh, shared uh, address space and and, and a, a, a copy of the data in memory that everybody can get to there's certainly additional opportunity and you, you can you, you know fundamentally you can there are ways in which we, you can trade capacity for for compute right and if you're very cpu limited then you know that's more difficult to do but as you introduce more acceleration uh, that definitely gives you another opportunity to attack uh, a memory cost so so yes i think you are very right <laughs> Thank you. Any other question? Okay. All right, if there is no other question, I would like to take this moment to thank all of the audience. And of course, a big thanks to all our instructors uh, and special thanks to Peter for leading this entire course development. And a very special thank to you uh, for developing all the Docker and building all the backend technology and to make this uh, entire thing available uh, open to the community so that everyone can get hands-on experience so thanks a lot and also a big thanks to uh, Zaid, uh, Johan and other instructors and another thanks to Dr. Uh, I mean another th uh, other thanks to Ganesan Narayan Swami who is kind of the open power lead and enabler for this course I hope this course will help uh, the entire community in terms of learning, development, and big data analytics. And I'm sure you di didn't need to leave out Philip, right? His uh, oh, application. I'm sorry. So I is, have uh, was a, was a great video. motivator for us, you know, to to put this uh, this this course together. And of course, he also has uh, contributed uh, a, a lectures to to the class as well. So. Yep. Yes, uh, Dr. Philip Leonarski is another great contributor to this course who has done all the X-ray beam related use cases and uh, brought this course. In fact, we contacted Dr. Leonarski uh, first for this course and then everything started. Sorry for missing his name anyway. But okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Very okay. good. Yeah. I think we can leave it there. Sure. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone.